And the only pity is that, of course, we're not just off Trafalgar Square today, but it's still great to have you all with us, even if it is virtually. Um, now, for those of you who know me, for those of you who don't, you can probably see this is quite lucky that this is the last you're going to hear from me, that I'm not actually chairing tonight. And so I'm going to hand over to my colleague from the No Same London Global Gateway, the Reverend Dr. Jim Lees, who is Senior Director for Academic Initiatives and Partnerships at the Gateway. Father Jim. Thank you, James. I appreciate that. So greetings all. A uh, warm welcome to you from all the team at the Notre Dame London Global Gateway who are coordinating this event today. Uh, as James said, I'm Father Jim Lees, and I'm delighted to be able to uh, join with you uh, and James to, uh, to welcome Frank. At this time, I'd like to thank um, the Center for Catholic Studies at Durham. They have been a terrific partner over time, and uh, we're so grateful to have been uh, working with them on so many interesting and innovative programs over the last 10 years. Um, before I introduce Frank, I want to begin with informing you about the few logistics that will be necessary. We ask you to use the Google form that you'll find in the chat space to submit any questions that you have, may have for Frank. And we'll try to get to as many of them as possible given our time constraints. But if you um, note the chat space at the bottom of your screen, uh, you'll find the form there. You can submit your questions at any time. We'll take them up after Frank's lecture, but you can submit them at any time during, during our time together. Frank Cottrell Boyce was born in Liverpool, studied English at Oxford University, and he's since proven himself to be a man of many talents. I think we all know that. He is an accomplished TV critic and writer for episodes of Coronation Street and Brookside. He's written a number of award-winning screenplays and several very successful novels and children's books, one of which was shortlisted for the Carnegie Medal. And if that wasn't enough, Frank, along with Danny Boyle, devised the opening ceremony for the 2012 London Olympics. We're honored and delighted to welcome Frank to Notre Dame today to deliver our annual Notre Dame Durham lecture, annual Christmas lecture. Frank comes to us from his home in Liverpool, and we welcome him now. Frank? You're on mute, Frank. Okay. I just got used to not having to unmute myself before speaking to people. <laughs> um, it's lovely to be here, and let's start with a little bit of the Nativity play itself. Uh, this is... Um, where's it going? There it is. Um, I'm going to share the sound. Someone with a nicer voice than me. Reading. Here we go. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. <laughs> That's from, um, I'm going to stop sharing. That's from a Radio 4 nativity that my wife Denise and I put together with some children from a school, well, from a series of schools in Strangford Lock in Northern Ireland. Um, that wasn't a school child, that was Liam Neeson reading it. Um, and he did the narration um, Better than I did when I was um, a school child, because I do remember saying, now when Quirinius was gov governor of um, Jerusalem and everyone, um, and getting that sentence wrong. Uh, Liam agreed to do that, but after one phone call, just by return of, after return of phone call, because everybody, I think, feels the pull of a nativity play. Everyone remembers being in one. Everyone feels that the part they played in the nativity play has some kind of pull of destiny about it. The nativity play has always been really, really important to me. I bought this. This is, um, this is the life of St. Francis that I was given for my first communion. And um, I can still see all the stains from my first communion breakfast on it. And there uh, is the page where St. Francis, scholars dispute this, but I'm giving ground to no one. St. Francis invented the nativity play in Greco. My wife Denise does a nativity play every year for our parish, which she does on the Epiphany. And last year, um, obviously that couldn't happen because of COVID. 
And rather than allow that chain to be broken, because we still walk around the parish and I still see now people who are strapping young undergraduates and think that was Herod back in the day and this one was Mary back in the day and that was a very loud angel back in the day. It stamps you. Who you are in the nativity play kind of stamps you. She wouldn't let that chain be broken, so she wrote a special nativity play that could be filmed. Uh, each child was filmed individually, and then I cut it back together again. And we published that for Mary's Meals, and people did it all around the world because everybody felt the same, that nobody wanted that chain of nativity plays to be broken. There's one, and there was, they came in from all over the place, incredibly creative, even though the words were the same. They felt so different. There's one uh, that came in from Prescott near us, which they just went full Oliver Stone on the whole thing. News reports of desert landscapes. It just looks like uh, something that David Lean had shot. Uh, my own history of making nativity plays is that my, when my son was in reception, he was very, very excited to be a king uh, in the nativity play. And on the night, it turned out that like about half the class were kings because the nativity play in some, in some ways had just degenerated into a kind of photo opportunity. So he never actually got on the stage with too many kings. And I was so sad for him that I went home and got my video camera out and we improvised a nativity play. And then we did that every Christmas for the next, I think 15 or 16 years. So I have this gorgeous record of them growing up. You know, like, like some people dream of doing that with um, photo booth pictures, but I have this record of them growing up from when they were young enough to play a baby to when they were old enough to play Herod. Um, I also, the title of this speech comes from a book that I wrote called Millions. It's a, it's a sentence from Millions, which is the book that won the Carnegie Medal. Um, and it's the, the title is, I wanted to live all my life inside a nativity play and the older I get, the truer that gets. So that's all the sort of personal investment in the nativity play. But I also have a strong feeling as a writer that the nativity play has played a really important part in the history of our church, in the history of Christianity and the dissemination of Christianity, an underestimated part. And I think perhaps part of the power of the nativity play is that it is underestimated. It's the only art form that I can think of where the audience is palpably waiting for it to go wrong, where you are sitting on the edge of your seat, waiting for your child who is the angel Gabriel to make an annunciation to you instead of the Virgin Mary. You're waiting for that child who can't get his mouth around frankincense to say, Frank sent this. Um, you, you're waiting for the innkeeper to say, oh, do come in. All those things, that all those stories that we know are Wayne in a manger. It's a whole genre. There's a three movie franchise about nativity plays going wrong. It is the only form where we want things to go wrong. And in this, that strangled one that I've just played you, I can remember the little boy who gives the lamb, who plays the, what was wonderful about that play was that they were all rural children. So they struggled with a lot of the play, but it really came to life around sheep. <laughs> they, and the farmers, the, the sheep farmer, the shepherds had by far the biggest part in that play. And I, my most vivid memory is of a little boy handing the sheep to Mary and saying, there's a wee sheep, careful, he might butcher. You might butcher. Um, the, the, because the nativity play is the point at which our theology of the incarnation hits the street. It's where the incarnation takes on its full meaning of Christ being part of ordinary life. And it's the part of our theology that faces children and the unchurched. It's the part that looks outwards. And I think it's that openness to the human, to the fallible. This, it's a celebration of imperfection. There's a humility to the form that is the reason that it passes under the radar. And that's what I think is the answer to why it has had such a huge influence, which I'll start to uh, talk about. Um, everyone agrees that, well, people don't agree actually, but I'm not having any discussion of it, that the nativity play was invented by St. Francis. Um, and there's this beautiful account from St. Bonaventure describing how Francis in Grecio that night prepared a manger, brought hay and an ox and an ass to the appointed place. The brethren were summoned, the people ran together, 
the forest resounded with their voices, and that venerable night was made glorious by many and brilliant lights and sonorous sounds of praise. And the saints stood before the manger while the Holy Gospel was chanted. And then he preached to the people around the nativity of the king. And that's, that's definitely, the, um, there's all kinds of discussion about whether you can trace the beginning of the nativity play further back into Byzantine liturgy. But I think that is the origin myth that we're, we're gonna stay with. And I want to stay with it because it's beautiful and because it is about reaching out to people. And it's also got this beautiful thread in it, which is that it's after St. Francis comes back from the Holy Land and has realized this very practical thing that people will not go to those places. They will never see those places. And he wanted to sort of bring something of that back to him, to them. The first kind of properly recorded seed is a kind of extension of the liturgy called the pastores, where some choristers dressed up as angels would process towards the sanctuary and they would be stopped by the priests who would ask the question, quem quaretis in prosepi, who are you looking for in the manger? And then the shepherds would sing their song, which is the setting of Salvatorum Christum Dominum. And then and that those two hymns, the antiphonal hymns would answer each other. And then there'd be this amazing moment when a statue of Mary would have been, the lower part of the statue of Mary would have been wrapped and then the curtain would be pulled back and there would be maybe a baby or a doll of some sort, but the representation of the baby illuminated in this dark church so that you get this moment of transfiguration of something that's happened to everybody, birth, <laughs> literally could not be more mundane and there it is lit and stood in a different light the, moving on from the past stories the first kind of proper extension to that uh, is a thing called the stella and we know about this from um, saint nicholas's church in yarmouth where we have the accounts for it and the stella was another addition to the liturgy a song um, where a candlelit star would pass over the heads of the congregation on a set of pulleys and three kings in full costume with frankincense going all over the place would follow that star to the altar. And if you go to Great Mark Garmouth, you can still see the kind of the, the, the invoice for, I've got it here, item, making a new star, leading said star, making new bulk line for star. So there's the kind of expenses claimed for it. And this is another thing that the Nativity players bought with. The, the Nativity plays a great carrier of technological innovation. I talked to you before about Denise's um, online nativity, this sort of global event that went around the world. You know, people filmed it, people cut it together. People who couldn't be together would be brought together by it. People would see each, each other's children in it. That's a kind of a technological innovation. But it's always had that thread in it. Um, so for instance, the Stella on the, the pulley. And for a while, the medieval, medieval church as a whole was besotted with automata. And this is something I'm absolutely obsessed with because we've somehow lost the folk memory. We've forgotten all about the role of liturgical automata. There was a lot of technology in the medieval church. The word Android was crowned by Saint Al was invented by uh, Albertus Magnus, by Saint Albert the Great, who had made an Android. He'd made this kind of speaking robot figure. And its voice was so annoying because it was created by wind whistling through pipes. It was so annoying that uh, Thomas Aquinas smashed it up. So a piece of uh, canonical vandalism, there, which is linked into the history of the nativity play. That is not the end of the affairs with church, church's affair with robots. St. Aquinas might have wanted it to be, but some of you probably heard of the Rood of Boxley Abbey in Kent, which was this hugely successful pilgrimage attraction <laughs> I'm using the word attraction on purpose. And it was in the shape of this anatomically terrifying Christ writhing in agony on the cross. And it would look upon some pilgrims with disdain and on others with love. And to see it, to get in to see the, the rude, the mechanical rude, you had to pass this test. You had to pick up uh, St. Rumwald. There was this little model of St. Rumwald and you had to pick it up. And, some people, no matter how strong, could not budge it. And other people only had to touch it and it would float into the air. And that would determine whether Christ looked on you with love or disdain. Um, it was decommissioned in 1538 by 
Thomas Cromwell, who'd, who said it was a, a, how it worked. He said it worked through old rotten sticks in the back, which caused the eyes to move like a living thing. And it needed not Prometheus's fire to make it lively, but only the covetousness of priests. Um, and throughout the 16th and 17th century, this is huge philosophical debate about machines and souls, um, because machines can seem like us. Um, Descartes is very involved in this. Descartes got very kind of wound up about, there's an amazing moment in Descartes' diaries when he's looking out at people in Antwerp going about their business and thinks, well, how do I, in what way are these people not programmed like robots? Um, there's a huge thing about, the, there's a famous robot of a shitting duck. It eats and then it excretes. And in what way is that not alive? Huge, huge discussion about this. Descartes is reputed to have replaced his daughter with a mechanical daughter, which was lost overboard in a ship. I'm, I'm going off on my, uh, my obsession here. All of these things were outlawed by the, uh, the Council of Trent, who, which ruled against unusual machines in churches. The, the one exception was the nativity. Because, and the mechanical nativity and you can still see some of the remains of it because these have all gone in some of the great clocks of Central Europe, the great church clocks of Cologne. Um, well, Dresden's obviously gone, but um, these, these great church clocks that often had Magi striking the time or appearing at the time or Our Lady appearing. These are kind of the, the last remnant of these mechanical nativities. The Jesuits were very keen on them. They were always trying to, you know, they tried to impress... Chinese emperors with one of these. They had this peaceful one that had sort of sheep moving around, angels constantly rising and falling, the shepherds filing past the manger, angels flying over the manger, and very sweetly, and very importantly, I think, Joseph rocking the cradle as the ox and the ass knelt down. Absolutely astonishingly beautiful. There's something quite like it that you can see in the Volkskunstmuseum in Dresden. My, my absolute favourite of these, by the way, and this is very much by the way, is the one that I think was in Cologne of St. Peter being rescued from the storm by Jesus, which was um, St. Peter was falling into these mechanical waves and he's rescued by a magnetic Jesus. So as Jesus got nearer, the magnetism would pull Peter out and it's with a real jolt, an amazing thing. All, all outlawed in 1563 by the Council of Trent. The Reformation attack on these and the Council of Trent's attack on these was all predicated on the idea that it was fraud. Jessica Riskin wrote this fabulous book that I really recommend to everybody called The Restless Clock. And she had this great phrase, she says, they were seen as material contraptions masquerading as spiritual beings. And I mean, often they were effectively paid attractions. You had a, definitely had a better chance of lifting St. Romwald into the heavens if you had paid a good wedge of cash to the priest. But I don't think that's all that's going on here. I don't think people really thought they were seeing a vision of a crucified Christ at um, Boxley. I think there's something more complicated there. I think there's something about the way spectacle and particularly magic can open your mind to wonder. People, I think people would laugh when they were messing about with St. Romuald, but they would be genuinely moved and genuinely weep at that spectacle of the agonizing, uh, agonized Christ. And I want to talk about that. I want to talk about all that because I think it's got a bearing on how nativity plays, because of, not in spite of their popularity and vulgarity, have these important things to teach us theologically and they've played a really important role in the church. And there's one change in particular that I was thinking about there. We were talking about the Stella the star approaching, the king's approaching the altar, guided by the star and the pulley. That liturgical moment grew, that little kind of liturgical addition grew and grew and grew, and you can trace it happening. First thing that was added was a little tableau of the kings having arrived on the altar, falling asleep, and then being woken up by an angel chorister who would warn them about Herod, and they would wake up and leave. Now, Drama is all about character. So the moment Herod gets mentioned, um, it's, he's going to take over. It's just going to grow. There's no way you can hold that back. Um, so 
uh, quite quickly from that kind of a first mention of Herod, you get Herod moving into the liturgical drama. Um, and particularly uh, the massacre of the innocents became a bit of a spectacle. So you would have choir boys singing, carrying a newborn lamb in procession through the church and then being genuinely being beaten up and left piled high on the altar while the priest who played Herod would rave and other priests robed would weep and, and then they'd all be aimed, comforted by an angelic consolatrix singing uh, up in the triforium. That's a drama and it's spectacle and it starts to grow. In a lot of churches, there was a prelude added to that, a parade of prophets, the way we might have at the Easter Vigil Mass, the sort of a set of prophecies that contextualize what's gonna happen, but there would be a parade and each of the prophets would carry their symbol. Uh, so you'd get, you know, Isaiah and John the Baptist, of course, all of these were upstaged by one very minor prophet, Balaam. And why? Because he had a donkey. This is the first pantomime nativity play donkey, pantomime donkey, um, little choristers dressed as a donkey going down the aisle, massively popular, upstaged everything. Stella Margotson, I don't know if, you, if people know about her anymore, but she was this wonderful novelist and she wrote these really genuinely delightful history books. I think she's still alive, she's about 110. Um, she wrote this gorgeous essay about the mystery, about the mystery plays in which she crops out this little moment between Balaam and the chorister who would be hiding in the pantomime donkey. Neddy, why do you shy and back, stubborn brute, obstinate and slack? Now my spurs shall rip and rack your ribs to the diaphragm cardiac. Um, they did love a bit of violence. And the boy concealed within the pantomime donkey would shout back in his little falsetto, an angel with a sword I see standing there in front of me, forbidding me to pass him by. I'm afraid I'm like to die. And Marcus has got this idea that there's this connection between the Feast of Fools, the Asinaria Festa, which is on the Feast of the Holy Innocents and these displays. Um, but much more importantly, that is the debut of The Little Donkey. So by that point, you've got people dressed up as donkeys, you've got choir boys being beaten up in the aisle, the, and stars going overhead, and kings dressed up, and frankincense all over the place. The drama is literally bursting out of the church. Uh, its vulgarity becomes inappropriate, its popularity, which is kind of the more important thing, I think, meant that the audience, because it's stopping to being a congregation that's becoming an audience, don't fit in the church. So the drama moves out. First, it's all in the church precincts, in the graveyard. And then you get the trade guilds involved. And we are at the point where these liturgical additions become the great cycles of the mystery plays. And it's the 13th century. And all the, we've got scripts for four of the great cycles for Chester, York, Wakefield and Coventry. That, those scripts are much later, they're all 15th century, but, we, but they, a good representation of what those plays were. They were huge, they were huge. This was our national drama. There are 48 plays in the York cycle, which would start at four o'clock in the morning and go on right into the night. And the nativity section of that was undertaken by the tile thatchers, the roof thatchers, and the magi were the goldsmiths and the slaughter of the innocent ones, the nailers. Uh, and so each member was required to contribute, um, to pay pageant penny, pennies towards the expenses. Costumes and the vestments were often, often borrowed from great houses or from the church. So that, that kind of weird kind of financial, ad hoc financial infrastructure, that is very like the way a parish nativity or a school nativity is done with your parents making the costumes and borrowing things and passing them down for years. There's a, and I'm going to nick a, another line from Margotson. She said, the liturgical plays had been designed to Christianize humanity. The mystery plays sought to humanize Christianity. I'm not sure that's completely right, but it's a good way of thinking about them. I think it's right. I think it's relevant when you think about the incarnation, because it means that they were being, God has been incarnated into daily life. These plays were put on by work guilds, 
you know, but by people who knew each other from work, by relationships that were apprentice relationships, employer relationships. This is for a God who, be, who worked, who was a carpenter. So in the Coventry Annunciation play, which I just read again for the first time for years, the other night, it's so real. It's like a kitchen sink drama. It really kind of works away at Joseph's worry that he's been cuckolded. And it plays with that kind of, what, what is the great comic idea of the Middle Ages, which is the May, May December wedding, the foolish old man who marries the young woman. That's really strongly there. Joseph's like dangerously held up as like a figure of fun for the first half, and then it completely flips. So it's holding up this sort of transcendent idea of Immaculate Mary and the Holy Family against human appetites. It's holding the cracked plate up to the light. And for me, way the most elegant, most brilliant, most illuminating of these plays, one of the, I think one of the great plays in the English language, here's the second shepherd's play from Wakefield, which is written by the Wakefield master. And it's very written. It's not, but this isn't folk theater, this is high art, you know. It starts, that starts with some very, very, very real shepherds. And they're moaning about the weather and the taxes and they're very distinct characters. One of them moans a lot about his wife. He says, she's browed like a bristle and great as a whale. And another of them, Mac, shows up and he steals one of their sheep and they chase him home, they're gonna beat him up. And when they get to the house, they can't find the sheep because his wife has hidden it in the cradle and they nearly get away with it. But the very, very last minute, one of the pursuant shepherds um, notices that this baby has got a snout and four legs. And there's a great kind of outburst there. And even then they try to kind of get away with it. They say, oh, it's a changeling, it's been taken away. And where is our child? And, and at that point, the angels are up and say, do not be afraid and announce that this other lamb, the lamb of God is elsewhere in a stable and they're gonna go and see him. This is so rich in imagery. And whenever I read it, I think of Pope Francis saying that the shepherd should smell of the sheep. This is a great work of art that really smells of sheep. And this is a vision of the incarnation that really smells of sheep. I mean, really smells, I mean, you read those pages, you can genuinely, you can feel the lanolin, you can hear <laughs> it, it's all there. Um, and what I wanted to pick out about that particular nativity um, say and point out how kind of important it is, is it's in the vernacular, uh, not even just in English, it is in the accents of a particular place and the concerns of a particular place. Not, not just in the vernacular, it's in the dialect. This is a version that sets the story down into our daily lives. And I wanna say that's the first time, but of course it isn't because that cast of characters, shepherds, fishermen, young women, donkeys, comes from the gospel. The gospels were there first. And these plays really reach back to that spirit of openness, the ordinary, ordinary lives, ordinary people. From the first pastores, the center of the play, play, the key moment is the revelation of this most ordinary of things, a baby. I mean, that is the opposite of how theatre works. There should be a revelation of something extraordinary. You know, the other ancient form of theatre is pantomime. And the key moment in pantomime is Cinderella transformed into the ball, the beast transformed into the handsome man. This is a revelation of something unbelievably ordinary, a baby that is also divine. That, that moment that God has cast himself as a little child. And the question out of which all of these plays grew from the pastores is, who are you looking for? That's the question that that baby will say when he's grown up 
to the guards on the night that they arrest him. Who are you looking for? And that question, who are you looking for? In the end, that's the only question we should ask ourselves every day. Who are we looking for? And that's the question that relativity plays, are constantly asking. I was going to, I've kind of exhausted my thoughts, but I was going to play you the end of that nativity play that I, that my, that Denise and I made in Strangford Lock, because I think these children, children's voices sum up exactly what I'm talking about. Look at your hair. How can I do that? Sorry about this. Here we go. The end. Yeah. Stop it, the kings didn't go back to King Herod. The kings went home with everywhere. And Joseph and Mary and baby Jesus went back to Nazareth on the donkey. That's really it. That's really it. The end. I love to be an angel. I loved being Mary. I'm the fairy godmother. I love being the storyteller. I love to be God. <laughs> Is that really the end of the story? The baby will grow up to be strong. He's the king of the whole world. He's just a very kind king. When he grew up, he went up to heaven. He wanted to look after everybody. He prayed for everybody who died. Jesus put him on the cross. He was dead and then he went back to life again. He was dead and then he came back to life. No, he was dead and then he came back to life and then he came back to life. And he's still alive. He's still alive. When I grow up, I'm going to be a farmer. Yeah, yeah, the farmer. Yes, God has lambs and sheep and yeah, horses and cows and chickens and hens yeah, and geese and farts because he's a farmer. No, he's not. He has and he has rabbits and probably a duck and he has parrots. A parrot? And he has birds. He's just full of animals. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Bless all the dear children in your doctor care and bring us to heaven to live with the dark. Thank you, Frank. That was lovely. Um, unless we, that's lovely. I just lovely. I'm thinking of, you know, uh, unless we behave as little children, we can't enter the kingdom of God. And that was just a magnificent uh, profession of faith by those, those lovely children. And thank you for, uh, for your words. I, uh, I might steal some of it for a homily, just so you're prepared. <laughs> Um, it was lovely, truly. Um, I just want to remind our participants today, those of you online with us, that uh, you're welcome to um, submit questions in the Google forum. I know that some of you are submitting them uh, in the chat room. It would help us um, if you submitted them through the Google forum that you find on the chat space, uh, and then we'll, we'll um, bring them forward to Frank. Uh, it automatically populates a, a sheet that I can take them from. Um, Frank, I'm just curious. Um, I had the great pleasure many years ago to be in a CC for um, for Christmas, and uh, 
as St. Francis is said to have, and I believe it too, um, to have you know, conceived of the, the nativity play first, it's also that he conceived of the crash as well, it seems to me. And yes. how do you make that connection in terms of, it, that was a powerful Christmas moment for us. That was our favorite. I'm one of 10 kids born in, you know, a rather compressed period of time, you know, about 10 years. But it's a, uh, it was such a lovely thing. You felt a part of that story because of these, this little thing, especially as a child. But even now, I just have a fascination and love for the, the crash as well. For the portability of it and for the fact that everyone could have one. We've ended up having one in every room in the house over the holiday. I mean, I think that is part, I mean, that it's, it, it's, I think the fact is he was, a, he was, as well as a saint, he was a genius. You know, he's a genius communicator. Um, and his genius comes from this sort of generosity of heart that I want him to show what, you know, th there's something very, prof like one of the reasons I don't want to let go of that as an origin myth is that there's something, it, it trembles around its edges with the things that you don't remember about it. So it is, he's just come back from the Holy Land. He's just been to see the Sultan, you know, he just reached out and uh, to another faith, that, that whole kind of, mo it's a big moment of kind of reaching out for him is what's going on. N not even evangelization, I don't think. He had this thing about, uh, in um, Pope Francis's, uh, oh, I can't remember which one it is, but it starts with a description of Francis's journey to the Sultan and says, you know, he didn't go to persuade anything. He, he went to be, to be there in a spirit of fraternal love. And it's just the ex that exhibition of love is what that um, crash is. And what's extraordinary, and I, I think Franciscan about it is that it puts an ordinary family in the same, like it, it, it roots the incarnation in work, ordinariness, doing stuff, smells, you know. And yeah, it's, 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 it's such a great toy to play with, you know. Oh, that too. It really yeah. emphasizes the, uh, the baby becomes the divine, you said earlier, because it, it has the kings coming from the east, and you know, and, and and even as a child, you're thinking, "Wow, these he really must have been a big deal," you know. And yeah. it's really quite lovely the way it plays out, and, and the way it uh, stirs the imagination. I think and it's just, yeah. you know, he was he was the wise one from the east at that point. <laughs> yeah. Um, there is also a, a couple of questions that are coming in. I, if if the nativity play was the vernacular in the old days, so to speak. What might its equivalent be now? Where might it be found? This is sort of a speculation of sorts, but I mean, where might we we have a similar encounter with isn't, isn't the extraordinary thing the fact that it's still a lot, like I I came into this talk thinking, because I, I mean, I do get, I, I go to a lot of school nativity plays and you find yourself being kind of annoyed by, you know, and I'm playing the ladybird or I'm playing the spider. And it, it's like, it seems to get bigger and bigger and more and more, like if you watch those nativity films, which I think the first nativity, the, the, you know, the, I don't know if you're aware of it, Father Jim, but we have a British film franchise called Nativity! Exclamation mark, And there are three episodes in that, with David Tennant in, is in them, and, um, it, and they're, they're big commercial films. And the first one's really terrific. It really, really feels like a portrait of a country that I know. But I, it sometimes feels as though the spirituality is being pushed to one side. I mean, what was powerful about the one that Denise wrote for Mary's Meals, which is still available, if any of you are teachers on the Mary's Meals website, if you go to the Mary's Meals Children's Resources, you can download the script there. That's the one that we did, she did to, um, for lockdown. That's sort of trying to put the incarnation back into the centre of it. So it's, a, but, but when I was looking at the history of it, I was thinking that, that tug between, that balance between the divine and the ordinary is always, it's always a struggle. You know, it, it, the, the nativity play wants to get into the nitty gritty of your ordinary life. Well, and that, that was confirmed in some ways when you said that it was in the vernacular, you know, very early that, you know, it became a local thing and anyone could participate. It wasn't exactly. in the and I, I wonder if that's like, you know, I pulled back from that but I wonder if that's the first time, I mean, that's the face, that's the teaching face of the church is in those mystery plays, I think. That, I, and I wonder if that's, I, I'm no scholar at all, but I wonder if that's the, it, that, that's sort of the first sort of vernacular teaching on any scale. You know, it's, it's, it's very outward facing. It's very 
in the marketplace, it's very trying to, it's very Pentecost, you know, it's speaking with many tongues, depending on where you play it. Um, yeah, I think it is really, there's something really profound there that we've kind of failed to celebrate. I know we love the old language and especially the scriptural aspects to it, but is there, someone's asking, is there a modern vernacular that might make it, you know, sort of more appealing, more interesting? I, I think we're, if we, as I get older, I value more and more that which has been than I did maybe when I was younger, but is there a way in which it might, you know, better appeal or draw people in? I, I mean, I think it's always being reinvented. I think that's what's wonderful about it. It's constantly reinventing itself. And it just, it, I think it needs us to treasure it. You know, I think as a church, we've kind of seceded it to the, the school. And, we, and, you know, our schools try to please everybody. I think, you know, parishes should probably do more activity play so that you get that balance back. Um, but it is constantly reinvented itself. It's always speaking in the language. I mean, as you remember it, I mean, I think like, a, not exactly a nativity play, but a wonderful thing I could point you towards uh, there was a woman in Dublin who got the children to tell Bible stories in the 1950s. And that's still, I can't, it's, it's called Give Up Your Owl Sins. And you can find it on YouTube, Give Up Your Owl Sins. And it, it's amazing how easily these themes can be spoken in the real language of, of a place. That's lovely. Um, there is a question in that vein, uh, Frank. Um, there's great gratitude being expressed for your presentation, by the way. I should add that here because many are delighted by it. But um, do you think there are particular advantages to having a nativity play where members from the whole congregation are the actors rather than only the kids? Yeah, it's, it's absolutely. I think that's what's happened. That it's kind of just become a children's thing. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and it's and the, the like I said at the very beginning, we, it's, the, it's the one thing where the audience are willing it to fail. Um, because that is cute and it is cute and there's no denying it. But like we talk, like these plays that I'm talking about, the Second Shepherd's play, these are great works of art performed by grown ups, you know, and taken very seriously, rehearsed, stayed up all night doing them. And I think, you know, there are places that still do this this week. If anyone is listening from Crosby on the beach here at Crosby, another place is doing a nativity play with real camels in the bitter cold of that beach. Uh, by the light of the moon and and that's adults and that it will be amazing I, this this story is astounding you know this is the story that says you know as john betchman said if it is it true and is it true um this most tremendous tale of all because and if it's true for if it is nothing else matters and this is the this is this you know this is the moment when it's closest to us you know i think because it's rooted in us, like I said, you can get, when Denise did her um, online nativity, she got Gerald Butler to be in it. When we did the Radio 4 one, we got Liam Neeson to be in it because everybody, no matter how big they get, remembers that moment and kind of wants to revisit it, you know? Indeed, there, there, there's a question that relates to this too. Do you think British TV covers nativity plays well enough? I know there's this grand wave of secularism going on. And if not, is this a bit of a mess on their part? Yes, definitely. <laughs> you should just do a nativity play. I think mean, that there's been a series of passion plays, hasn't there? Port Talbot passion play was really good. And, you know, I think there's definitely scope to do. Oh, and I think there was a Liverpool nativity one about four or five years ago, which, again, to talk about how it reinvents itself in adults' discourse, it's very alive at the moment as an, uh, an, analogy, an, an analogy of refugees. You know, these are two homeless people, homelessness, refugees, people pick up on the politics of that story a lot. So there are, you know, there are, there are grown up retellings of it. And I think if you look on YouTube, you'll see that the BBC did a really good one a couple of years ago. Yeah. I have to sneak this one in here. Um, Dr. James Kelly's father happens to be on, uh, in, our, in, our, in our crowd. And he, uh, he informs me that, uh, and he's a long time educator himself. And, uh, they had a live nativity play at, at his school and none other than James Kelly played the baby G. Mighty James Kelly. Yes, yes. James, what did James play? This is... Um... He, he actually played the infant Jesus. Very good. I've gotten over the fact that he was once divine. He can't let it go. 
I am, um, yeah, I've met a lot of actors who say they can play down in the age, but I've never come across one who can say I could actually play it. <laughs> Now you you mentioned Frank um, an essay on the mystery play during your talk. Do you, could, do you know who the author of that was? Yeah, she's she's really brilliant. Um, and I, I can't. It's Stella Margotson. Okay, it's, all her books are great. She wrote this great book of uh, a wonderful. And this is completely by the by, but she wrote a great book about. Um, Journeys by mail coach from the 17th century to the coming of the railways. Just little tiny reminiscences of it. Absolutely delightful thing. She's. A, uh, I think she's still alive. Her, her sister was a famous Hollywood actress. Anyway, Stella Margaret. Marvelous, marvelous. If you're able to, um, well, maybe you could say again your wife's um, uh, web page for um, the talk. We could put. Yeah, it so that was that was done for Mary's meals. Okay. Uh, which is a great charity and on the Mary's Meals website on the resources page I think is it children's okay. resources it's, it's, it's there's a resources page there right. you, can, right. you can download the script it was called the lockdown activity that's terrific I'm sure and people it allows you to do it with your phone and then cut it together on it I was going to suggest that I read the, a couple of pages from from where the title for the talk comes from we would love that the the time. Great. The ending. okay the big ending so the two bo- the millions is the story of two boys who find a bag full of money uh, one of them is incredibly venal and the other one has visions of saints and for very complicated reasons they're hiding out inside the school nativity play they've got the- they've hidden the money in the donkey saddlebags and they know they're about to be pursued and um, Anthony, Anthony's the venal one, was playing one of the kings. His teacher said, now there are three kings, Melchior, Caspar and Balthazar. Which do you want to be? The one with the gold, said Anthony. The one with the gold was Melchior. Miss Nugent made Anthony a block of gold out of a Rockport shoebox wrapped in gold paper. He carried that block of gold with him everywhere and became inspired and interested by the historical aspects of the nativity story. For instance, he said, do you realise how much a block of gold that big would be worth at today's prices? A lot. An awful lot. It makes you wonder. What does it make you wonder? Well, Jesus had all this money when he was little. And then later on, when he was grown up, he was poor. They must have spent it. They must have had a great time. We had a big dress rehearsal. We didn't go home after school. We took sandwiches and waited in class for our turn to see the makeup lady, which was Trisha's mum. There were dozens of little girls dressed as angels, and they had to stand in the corridor and practice silent night and little donkey until they sounded like real angels. Miss Nugent kept giving them orange squash. I know they weren't really angels, but they still made me feel safer. Trisha's mum drew lines on my face with an eyebrow pencil to make me look old, and she made my hair grey with flour, and I was ready to go on. I'd already managed to Google up quite a lot about St Joseph. I think Miss Nugent found it very useful. For instance, when it was my turn to knock on the inn door, she said, Remember, Damien, be tired. St Joseph has walked a long way, so he's very tired. I said, Well... He was a carpenter, so he was very fit. And the walk to Nazareth, people did that all the time. He would have been like taking a bus. Also, they were gonna have a baby, so they weren't planning to sleep. They might have been stressed, but it wouldn't have said tired. And you could see she was impressed by my analysis, by the way she said, yeah, whatever. And went straight <laughs> off to the Three Kings. When I came off, Trish's mum said, my beard was too tight. The elastic's making your ears go red. See if you can fix it. So I went into the boys' toilets and tried to loosen it in the mirror. There was a man in there already with a huge black beard and a big wooden staff. I knew straight away it was St. Joseph. I just have to say, said St. Joseph, you're doing a great job. Thanks. I'm not making you sound too stressed, am I? No, I was stressed. Just the way you're playing it. You've really put me back in there. Thanks. Do you want me to take you through the birth? Because obstetrics and gynecology has changed a lot. No, I think we're going to skip that bit. Okay, break a leg. In the corridor, I practiced with Dave the donkey. Dave the donkey was made of plywood and fun fur. He stood on a platform with casters on, and he had a pair of black sacking saddlebags stuffed with straw. I took him out into the corridor and practiced pulling him up and down with Mary on his back. It took a while, but I eventually got the knack of it, of steering him. We powered up and down the lino doing three-point turns. Rebecca kept saying, I will be the mother of God. I will be the mother of God. I will be the mother of God. I would be the mother of God, over and over. And we could hear the angels practicing. It was on a starry night. And I wish that I could live my whole life inside a nativity play. 
Ah, lovely. Lovely. I should point out that um, we have people as far away as Canada uh, with us today, and there's a whole array of people who have expressed their gratitude for your, for your lovely talk, Frank, and we're really very grateful. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, as, as we conclude, I just want to thank all of you again for joining us today. Um, we have many programs over the course of the year, and we're especially grateful when they involve our collaboration with Durham University and the Center for Catholic Studies. I want to give a particular thank you to Paul Murray, Karen Kilby, Tim Guinan, Teresa Phillips, and Jane Lidstone, and of course, James Kelly. Um, while this program has been virtual, a lot of work still goes on behind the scenes, so I want to thank the London Global Gateway team and Notre Dame International, particularly Joe Byrne and uh, Charlotte Parkin, to whom much credit has to be given for the wonderful and longstanding partnership we have with, for the Center of Catholic Studies. You'll note that in the uh, chat feature, we've included uh, Frank's wife, Denise's um, link, link to the page that Frank has, has mentioned uh, about her, her nativity play. Um, and then finally, and perhaps most of all, Frank, we want to thank you for a wonderful and thoughtful lecture from Notre Dame. We wish you and your family and all who are on this call an, abundant, uh, an abundance of blessings during these Advent days of waiting. And when it comes, uh, may you all have a merry and blessed Christmas. Thank you to you all. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. Thank you.